heads and let's pray once more. Our Father, would you, by your Spirit, minister to each one of us right now. We don't simply want to be people who have performed some sort of act of comprehension. We don't want to simply understand some grammar better. We want to know the God of heaven better. And therefore we would plead, you would answer our prayers beyond our deserving, beyond even our asking, in showing us your Son and therefore showing us yourself. Help us, we pray, for we are so needing of your help. And these things we ask in Jesus' name. Amen. Um, Please do turn back in your Bible to that reading that we just had. So um, page 1063, if you've got one of the red Bibles in hands, to John chapter 1 and verse 1 is where we're starting. This is a new series we're starting today, looking at John's life account, anticipating that this is going to run us through till Easter, um, and then we'll pause over Easter and do something different in the summer, um, and then we'll come back to John the same time next year and hopefully finish off this life account of Jesus. That is at least my intention. So we're going to be here for a number of weeks, but today we're just going to start off by looking at the first five verses, just the first five verses, to see what this book is all about. And as we start, let me ask you a question. I wonder how well you would say you know yourself. Uh, How well do you know yourself? Uh, How well do you know your weaknesses, your strengths, your quirks? How well do you know the things that push your buttons? Do you know what energises you? What drains you? Do you know what's caused all this to be the case. You understand how your upbringing has shaped who you are. All those... I wonder how accurate your estimate would be of yourself. Because in my experience, people who have a good understanding of themselves are often quite mature people. Often quite mature people. Able people. Or how about this one? How well do you know other people? How good are you at reading other people? Um, Do you accurately understand people's strengths and weaknesses? their quirks? Do you understand what energises them, what drains them? Do you you understand their limitations, how their background has influenced who they are? Actually, skill at life, getting through life, really depends not only on us understanding ourselves, but actually accurately understanding who other people are and looking with sympathy upon them. It's really key, isn't it, living in a world of relationships that we understand other people well. But one more question. Uh, This is the critical question. How well do you think you understand who God is? Do you understand his glory, his greatness? Do you understand his love, his holiness? How how well do you think you know God? Now, often, in, in the same way that people can get the wrong end of the stick in understanding who they are, And in understanding who other people are, often people can misunderstand who God is. Often people will like to say, I like to think of God as. But however you might like to think of God doesn't mean you've got the right end of the stick, does it? And actually, if you read through the Old Testament, that that first bit of the Bible before Jesus arrives, what we find is a catalogue of God's people distorting the reality of who God is in their thinking. And they, they, they are perpetually found committing the sin of idolatry, which simply is to boil God down to a more manageable picture, a more manageable representation of who God is, to shrink him down to our size, to try and cope with him. And actually that bias, that tendency, remains in our hearts. All of us are likely given enough time to distort and to dilute who God is in our thinking. And why why is that critical? That's really critical because we live in the world that God has made. And he's made us for a relationship with him. And if we don't understand who he is, we will simply stumble and blunder through life. If we're people who claim to live for God and trust him, if our picture of God in our minds is different from the reality of who God is as revealed in the Bible, then actually we're, we're ending up following an an apparition from our own minds, rather than the real and holy God. And if we 
if we do, in our minds, picture God as something less than he is, if we fail to grasp the immensity of his love, the extent of his power, the depths of his compassion, the reach of his authority, and the greatness of his glory, if we diminish all those things, actually when life is tough, we can fail to understand how great God's help could be to us. And when life is going really well, we could perceive that I don't need to bother with God because he's a boiled down version of God rather than the reality, the greatest person we could ever know, the one who brings us joy and satisfaction. Living in God's world, it is critical that we have a right understanding of who God is. And as we come to John's Gospel, and as we look at just these first five verses today, it's my prayer that God would, to some extent, press a reset button in our thinking, and he would refine and refocus us in our understanding of who God is, so that we don't have a contracted picture of God, we don't paint a picture of who we want God to be, but we really see him for who he truly is. And the reason why that is possible is because, as we remembered at Christmas, God is not absent from our world. He is present with us by his spirit, but wonderfully, he stepped into time and space in the person of his son, and he stood upon our world. He was here. And it's in the face of Jesus that we can get to know who God is. So as we start the new year, I want to do something very simple, but also something very profound, and I just simply want to say, do you know God? And I want to show you Jesus, and I want to say, here is God. And you might say, Tom... I've been a Christian for long enough. That sounds very obvious. And I'll say, yes, it does. But I also want to quote George Orwell, who said once, he said, sometimes the first duty of intelligent man is a restatement of the obvious. And actually, the obvious things can often slip from our thinking. So I want us to put it before our eyes and say, do I know God? As we head into a new year, am I ready to lean on him hard for his comfort and his kindness? Am I ready to depend upon him. And the good news is that actually that's why John wrote his gospel. This book that we're going to look at is here so that we would know God and we'd know life in knowing him. Turn for a second to the end of the book. Now, page 1090, John chapter 20 and verse 30 and 31. Whenever you read a book in the, in the Bible, it's always helpful if there's a point in it where, where the, the person who wrote that book says, do you want to know why I wrote this book? Here it is. Here's the reason And there are a few books in the Bible that are clearer than John. John's just crystal clear. He's saying, let me tell you why I wrote this book. So John chapter 20, verse 30, if you've never looked in a Bible before, just to say the chapters, they're represented by the big numbers. The verses, they're represented by the little numbers. So under that little heading, the purpose of John's gospel, this is what John says. Jesus performed many other signs in the presence of his disciples, which are not recorded in this book. But these are written that you may believe that Jesus is the Messiah, that means God's saving king, the son of God, and that by believing you may have life in his name. Okay, did you get why John's John's written this? He said, so that you would believe, that you would grasp and you would trust that Jesus is who? God's saving king and God's son. Uh, so, So working in reverse, if we see Jesus... And he's God's son. We therefore know what God is like. And John says, if you get that, and if you rely on that, you get life. You get all of God's kindness and help and blessing in this life. It doesn't mean that difficult things won't come. They will, but you'll know the mighty help of the God of heaven, his love and kindness towards you and me. That's why he's written this book. Real life is found in knowing Jesus and therefore in knowing God and in believing in him. So if you're here this morning as someone who would say, well, I'm just looking into these things, I wouldn't call myself a Christian, this is just a brilliant book for you. Because it unpacks who God is and reveals Jesus to you. And we're saying this is the whole game. Keep coming back for John's Gospel. And if you're sat here as someone who's a Christian, please do not switch off. Don't think, well, I came to believe in Jesus years ago. The task for us is not a once-off to trust in Jesus, but to keep on believing in him every single day right to the end of our life. And what will help you keep believing in him? It will be to see him in all his glory as he's revealed in this book. Why should we want to listen to John especially? Well, because John was one of Jesus' 12 disciples. Um, He doesn't refer to himself by name in this book. 
Um, he instead refers to himself repeatedly as the disciple whom Jesus loved. It turns up that phrase turns up five times in chapter, 20, uh, in chapter 13, verse 23 is the first one, and then we find a whole load of others. It, it, actually, if you glance down to chapter 21, verse 7, then the disciple whom Jesus loved, John is talking of himself. And we, we get that as we look in other Gospels. We piece together that this is John. And he's one of Jesus' closest disciples. He rubbed shoulders with him for three years, ate, drank, and slept with him. He saw him when he was tired. He saw him when he was at his best. He saw him teaching, performing miracles. He saw him die on a cross. He was stunned when he rose from the dead. And his conclusion from spending three years with Jesus was, he is God's son, and he is God's saving king, and you need to know about him, so I'm going to write a book. You want to listen to the eyewitness evidence, and that is what we have here. And as we look at this passage, which I've called today's sermon simply, In the Beginning Was the Word, we're going to learn four fundamental and wonderful truths about who Jesus is. Okay, we're going to learn fundamental and awesome truths about who Jesus is. Here's the first thing. Jesus is the Word. Jesus is the Word. Look at verse 1. So back to page 1063 and John chapter 1. I'm just going to read that first bit of the first verse. In the beginning was the Word. In the beginning was the Word. Those first three words um, start another book in the Bible. Do you know which one? In the beginning? Genesis chapter 1, verse 1. In the beginning, God. Um, in the Old Testament, actually, the way you knew you referred to each book of the Bible was you referred to the first few words. It didn't have a name. It had the first few words. So John knew exactly what he was doing here as he copied. In our Bible, it's three words in the beginning. In the original, it's two words. John was being very deliberate. So Genesis 1 and 2 are totally fundamental for us understanding our world as they recount how God made everything. So if you want to know God, you want to know yourself, you want to know the world, we've got to understand it in light of Genesis 1 and 2. It is a foundational part of the Bible. And as John writes his very first two words, or our first three words, in the beginning, he's saying something equally, if not more foundational is happening here. Are you listening? In the beginning, right? this is really important. Really, really important. So we must listen. In the beginning, if we want to know God, if we want to know ourselves, if we want to know our world, we've got to listen to what he says next. In the beginning was the Word. Was the Word. And the big point John is making here is this, is that Jesus is the Word. Is God's Word, actually. You might say, okay, how do you get, how do you get to decode that name, the word, to be Jesus. Well, it's pretty simple. Look down to verse 14. We'll look at this verse more next week. The word became flesh and made his dwelling among us. We've seen his glory. The glory of the one and only Son who came from the Father full of grace and truth. Uh, what's more, we see John the Baptist is the one who's referring to this one, the word, and telling people about it. It's very clear that this is Jesus. But why on earth doesn't he call him Jesus? Jesus. Or doesn't he refer to him as God's son? Why don't he say, in the beginning was God's son? Or was... Why does, he doesn't say that because he picks a word that reveals something really important. He calls him the word because he is saying, in God's son, in Jesus, is the clearest revelation of who God is. I wonder if you've ever had that experience of meeting someone for the first time and they just, they're just quiet as a mouse. And conversation is all one way. And if you're anything like me, you're getting exhausted as you're trying to find out about them and you get at best one word or monosyllabic answers. It's exhausting, isn't it? And you're going, to, who is this? Who is this before me? Uh, em Emily and I watched the other night a, a film called The Blind Side. It's about a guy called Michael Orr who um, was an enormous guy teenager in the States um, who was made homeless because his mum was a drug addict just very quiet, ended up being enrolled in this school um, and then taken into this family who take care of him. And he just doesn't say anything for ages. And what he says is very brief. And he's going, who is this guy? What's going on? You, just, you need words. I need your word, Michael, to know you. Words are key. 
And actually, for us to know God, we must know his words. And what does God say to us here in this bit of this little verse? He says, in the beginning was the word. Jesus is the clearest revelation of what God is like and who God is. It is in knowing Jesus that we get to know God. That means that if we want to come to know God truly, if we want a true understanding of who God is, we must have an accurate understanding of who Jesus is. That's it. You've got to go to Jesus to find out who God is. And note this, that Jesus is not one option among many. He's not an option for finding out about God, and there are other options too. Actually, there's an exclusivity here, only Jesus, because, did you see, in the beginning was the Word, not a Word, the Word. And note too that Jesus is not plan B. God's Son coming to earth as a man is not plan B, It's not like he went through the whole Old Testament and he went, well, that didn't work, let's try something else. It has always been God's intention to send his son to earth. That's why it says, in the beginning was the word. So God's son was there in the beginning and he's always been called the word because he's always going to make God known the best. And that means that actually ignorance of who God is is only possible now if you'll close your eyes to who Jesus is. Listen to the way John Owen, who's a famous Puritan from the 15th century, he put it like this. He said, None could continue to be ignorant of God but those who would not see Christ. None could be, continue to be ignorant of God but those who would not see Christ. It's in seeing Jesus that you get to know God. So do you want to know God better? Get to know Jesus. You really get to know what God is like because Jesus is God's word. He is God's final words. There's a great verse in Hebrews chapter 1 that underlines this. It echoes what's said here. In the past God spoke to our ancestors through the prophets at many times and in various ways, but in these last days he has spoken to us by his Son. We get to know God through Jesus. And we get to see God in action as Jesus comes and as he works and he loves people, he draws close to the outcast, he confronts people who would deny God, and he reveals God to us. It's striking that in the Old Testament, God's word doesn't simply unpack God's intentions or his instructions. It actually is his way of working. God's word creates, judges, rescues, reveals. And so it is that that is what Jesus does as he turns up. He is the word. Jesus is the word. Now, beware of thinking that Jesus being called the word is a bit like saying he's just God's spokesman. This is not like the spokesman for the President of the United States who would stand in a press briefing room telling people about what the President's up to. Should they have an accurate diagnosis these days? I don't know. I'll leave that with you. But Jesus is not like a spokesman because he is God's word who has been there eternally. And also, he's not God's spokesman because we see next, Jesus is God. Jesus is God. Look at verse 1 again. In the beginning was the word and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. Grasp the significance of what's just there. Read it again and try and get the significance of this. In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. So John had spent three years with Jesus. Three years with him. Cheek by jowl. Seen him act, live, speak, teach, die and rise. And his conclusion was this, this man is God himself. Jesus is God, very God. The God who's always been, he is here, he he is in Jesus. In all of his glory, in all of his holiness, in all of his perfection, Jesus is God. And this has enormous significance for the coming weeks. As we study John's Gospel, as we meet Jesus, we are coming to know God himself. There is no more important task. Each week, in God's kindness, I pray God will reform and refine our understanding of who God is. So if I was able to say to you, do you know God? You could say, yes, because I've seen him in Jesus. I've seen him, and I know what he is like. He is the clearest picture of what God is. And if our understanding of who God is just doesn't fit with what's written here, then we need to be willing to say, well, 
goodness, as I've, I've met Jesus, actually, I've got to say that my understanding of what God was like was, was, was off beam. And, and we need to assume that actually what we read in the Bible is right and what we might be thinking might well be wrong. And we need to constantly be reforming our understanding of who God is in light of the Bible. And as we get who God is in Jesus, it should blow our minds and it should excite our hearts. Here's how John Owen puts it again. He says this, Moses desired to see the glory of God. He knew that the ultimate rest, blessedness and satisfaction of the soul could not come from seeing the works of God, but from seeing the glorious God himself. The best satisfaction for life is in seeing God. And we will see him in the weeks ahead. And may God help us worship him and trust him aright. Now, a brief aside, I need to mention this, because if you've ever talked with someone who is a Jehovah's Witness, and, and many of us here, I think, know Jehovah's Witnesses, would have friends who are Jehovah's Witnesses, they would take issue with what I've just said. Because they would say, hold on a minute, your version of the Bible is wrong. And they would say, it, it, where it says, in the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God, they'd say, whoa, 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 whoa. whoa. In the original, it doesn't have the word the before God so therefore it's not God it's a God they say it's and it's amazing how many Jehovah's Witnesses would say that none of them having ever looked at New Testament Greek ever and they instantly become a New Testament Greek expert let me say two things firstly that actually whether there is a translation this is technical but stay with me for just one minute and I'm going to come back okay I'm not going to speak Greek so that's good news okay I'm not going to speak Greek that would be I can't so that's okay in Greek, whether you translate the word the in the English doesn't simply depend on whether the word the is there in the original. Okay? So sometimes you can have words where it, the, the, the word the isn't there in the Greek, but you should have it there in the English. Okay? So it's complicated about when you do it. I studied Greek for three years at Bible college. This is something we learned in the latter years. And the thing is, the Jehovah's Witnesses are thoroughly inconsistent. Because there's another word in verse 1 that doesn't have the word the, but in the, your Bible and the Jehovah's Witnesses Bible, it's given the word the. Do you know which word it is? Begins with B and ends in beginning. Did you see? It, in their Bible, it doesn't say in a beginning. It says in the beginning. But in, in the original, it just says in beginning. So they're thoroughly inconsistent in the handling of Greek. But there's a much more profound reason. So they're thoroughly, un and they're just totally wrong about whether Jesus is God. He really is God. The translation in your Bible is totally correct. And I'll show you profoundly why that is true in a moment. But that's the easier thing to understand, and we'll come to it in a sec. Jesus really is God, and our friends with Jehovah's Witnesses are profoundly mistaken. They're profoundly mistaken. And actually, you've just got to do all kinds of manoeuvres to try and get around Jesus being God because he so clearly has proven to be so. One other thing, one other thing about Jesus being God is this. And this is, this is somewhat mind-blowing, okay? It is revealed that Jesus being God here means that the God that we know, the God who's revealed in the Bible, is Trinity. Do you see how it said? It says, in the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. What's revealed here is that God is Trinity. What, what does that mean? It means this, that while there is only one God, there is, the Bible's dead clear, there's only one God, that God has eternally existed as three persons, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. And all of the three persons are fully God. Father is fully God. Son, fully God. Holy Spirit, fully God. And yet there is one God. And you sit there and you go, how does that work? That's hard to understand. And I want to say, yes, it is. And I, to some extent, I make no apology for it. Is it any surprise that we, finite people, fallen people, find aspects of the eternal, awesome God hard to understand? Should that, be, should that surprise us? I don't think it should. I think there should be lots about God. If I could completely button God down and go, I completely understand him, I find that quite scary. Because God is totally different from me. He's awesome. I'm made in his image, but he's different from me. So it shouldn't surprise me that he is very different from me, that he is Trinity. But having said that this whole concept of Jesus revealing that God is Trinity is complex, it's wonderfully good news too. Can I say that? 
So, so note this. So note that he's, John is saying he is with God. So he, he was with God. God the Son was with God the Father. And God the Spirit was there too. All three were there. The reason why that is good news, that God is Trinity, that he's Father, Son, and Spirit, is this. Take another world religion for a second. Take Islam. Islam's projection of God, which is a false projection of God, says that Allah is monad. He's just a single person. He's on his own. That means that the concept of love and relationships is something that Allah had to learn. Because you can't love your... You can't really love yourself if you're on your own. So when Allah created, he had to learn to love. He had to learn relationships. And to some extent, relationships are new things. Whereas, imagine, now, because God is Trinity, as he's truly revealed in scriptures, he's truly revealed in the Bible, it means this, is that God has never had to learn to love. Because he's always loved. Eternally, he's existed, Father, Son, and Spirit, in perfect relationships of love. It is who he is. So when he made the world, he made you and me, he made us for a relationship, he wasn't going, now I need to get used to this relationship thing, let me learn about it. He's going, I've always known about it. This is who I am. And actually as we're made in his image, it helps us understand why relationships are so critically important to us. Because we're made in the image of a God of relationships. It's the wonderful news. It's why God being Trinity is great news. There's loads of other reasons I could say, but we'd be here and it'll be time for the evening service, and you'd always have to stay, wouldn't you? Because there's just too much to say. Too much to say. How much of late have you reveled in the fact that God is Trinity? Have you delighted that he is Trinity? It helps us understand his rescue of us. God the Father sent his Son. God the Son said, Father, I'm going. I will lay down my life. God the Spirit comes to us and says, let me give you new birth. Let me give you forgiveness. Let me apply salvation to us. Have you reveled in that lately? Have you remembered lately that God is Trinity? We must remember that it is so. Jesus reveals that to us. He is God. He is God. Thirdly, Jesus is creator. Jesus is creator. Look at verse 3. Through him, so that's through Jesus, through the word, all things were made. Without him, nothing was made that has been made. Think of the significance. Again, think of the significance of that. When was the last time you went out on a starlit sky? What you can't see, you can see some of our own galaxy, which contains, they believe, uh, about 200 billion stars. What you cannot see are the over 100 billion other galaxies besides the Milky Way. I don't know how many stars you're up to now. 100 billion times 200 billion. A lot of stars. And what did Jesus have to do with that? Or God the Son, the Word. He made it. He made it all. Think for a moment of things that are better known to us. Think of our planet for a second. 25,000 miles in circumference. Um, Cycling, if you wanted to cycle all the way around the world, you do 18,000 of those miles because the sea gets in the way and they don't make you ride through the sea, which is just cheating. I know, I know. But Mark Beaumont, who's the guy who holds the world record for cycling all the way around the world, is just a nutcase, and he managed to do it in 80 days. If I gave you a bike, it would take you at least a year to go around the world, and no doubt it would break most of us. A year just to go around and see just a little bit of the world. He made it in an instant with his word. Jesus made it. Think of something even closer to home. Think of yourself. Think of all the, all the little bit you understand of DNA, all that coding inside of us. Jesus wrote that all. He made it all. He made it. And, and grasp what that means for you and me. If he made us, actually it means that we owe him everything. And actually we'll only really understand ourselves when we know Jesus, because you've got to know a maker in order to know the things that are made. And actually if we grasp exactly how great Jesus is, that he is God revealed, and he is God the creator. It should make us be people who worship and adore him. I think again, think to the year ahead. This year might well contain things for us that are hard to deal with. It might well contain periods of darkness and difficulty. What do you want in that situation? You want someone who is your maker, don't you? A really faint illustration. Think of when you were a little child. When I got into scrapes as a little child, the person I wanted to turn up was my dad. 
I had a good dad. I realised this illustration works for good dads. But when I got into trouble, as long as I hadn't caused the trouble and I was going to get into trouble when my dad turned up, but just imagine that, it, it was, that there was a problem. I didn't simply want my sister with me. My sister's fun. She quickly became smaller than me. I didn't want my brothers with me nor my friends. I wanted someone who was, what did my father, to some extent, my maker. Because he was strong, he, was, he understood how things worked, he was dependable. That's just a tiny illustration, isn't it? As we go into life and we get into situations of deep trouble, we don't simply want another person who is created to come alongside us, because our knowledge is finite, our power is limited. We want the creator of all things to come alongside us. And John's good news of this gospel is he says in Jesus, that's, what tu- that's who turned up. That the kind of measure of help that we can know in life is that the Son of God, the Word, who is the Creator, has turned up, and he's turned up to help. And we see that actually in the last two verses. Jesus is the Word, he's God, he's the Creator, he is life, and he is light. Look at verse 4. In him was life, and that life was the light of all mankind. The light shines in the darkness, and the darkness has not overcome it. You remember the purpose of the book? You may believe that Jesus is the Messiah, the Son of God, and by believing in him, you may have life in his name. That we may know God's blessing and his goodness. And John comes here in verses 4 and 5, and he says, In the word there is life, real life, and that is the light of men. It comes to us, and Jesus doesn't have life in himself in some sort of monopoly. He said, I've got all the life, and you can have none of it. I'm going to have a great time. You can just, you're on your own. He says, I come with life, and I come to give it. Will you have it? It is like light in darkness. And yet we will see, especially next week, the light comes, and people just say, don't want to know. We're going to stick with the darkness. Thank you very much. He comes to a dark world. And this dark world rejects him, but did you note in verse 5, the light shines in the darkness, and the darkness has not overcome it. It's not put out the light. Jesus comes to a world shrouded in darkness, which rejects him, but his life is given, and the light truly comes. And he gives his life, his blessing to people who come and put his, their faith in him, in his life, death, and resurrection. And he comes to bring salvation to us. That is what this light is a picture of. This life is given. And as we look at our world, there is much darkness in our world, isn't there? You think of the man on Friday, the train from Surrey, heading into London, who's stabbed to death in front of everyone, in front of his 14-year-old son. Think of what is going on in Syria, going on in the Central African Republic. There is much darkness... In our world, there's darkness in our lives. People, we're here with big struggles. What does the word, what does God the Son have to say about this darkness? Where he said, I see this world is dark and I am coming down. I'm coming down, I'm coming. And he comes to bring his life and to bring light into our dark world. I wonder, did 2018 spell periods of darkness for you? Will 2019 spell darkness for you, for me? Where will light be found? It is found in knowing the God of heaven who stands over our world and who has come into our world in his Son. Do you know him? Do you, if you do, you've got, the lights can come on, the life can come, the blessing of God, which won't necessarily mean we will be extracted from our troubles and our struggles. But this life and light will bring hope and comfort in our struggles. Jesus will come and weep with us. He will come in his power to strengthen us and enable us to cope with all that would come our way. How do we know that Jesus is bringing light? Hey, just read the gospel. Come on Thursday, please. And we'll see why Jesus brings the light. We will see it wonderfully as we come to the wedding at Cana in chapter 2. What kind of life does Jesus bring? He comes to bring a life of abundance as he transforms water into wine and it just turns out to be the best wedding ever. We'll see the life that Jesus brings as he shows he has power over death in raising Lazarus from the grave. 
we will see the life and light that Jesus brings as he washes his disciples' feet in humility and love. We'll see the life that Jesus brings as he comes and meets a, a woman at a well who's a total outcast. Everybody has rejected her. Jesus draws close to love her. This is the life that he comes to bring. How well do you know God? Well, it's as we meet him in the person of his son, the Lord Jesus, that we get to know him and we get to know the life and light that he brings for us. Whatever the year holds, if it's good, I pray it's good, and you know God's blessing, let's remember that the richest blessing and life to the full is found in knowing Jesus. And if this next year is hard, remember Jesus the word comes to bring life and light. And that is found in knowing him. Let's bow our heads and let's pray. Our Father in heaven, we thank you that we don't simply have to guess about who you are, but you've made it wonderfully clear in the pages of the Bible that you, you are the eternal and mighty God who loves his people. Thank you that that's plain in the person of your Son, the Lord Jesus. And we pray, please, our Father, that you would help us rejoice that in him we know you. You're made known to us through Jesus. We thank you. We thank you that he is God and that in knowing him there is life and there is light and we pray that in the year ahead knowing Jesus would be the thing that equips and enables us to serve you well pray that if there are people here who don't know you that you would reveal yourself to them in your son the Lord Jesus and these things we pray in Jesus name amen